Hi, everybody. Uh, I see some names that I recognize and others that I don't. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Sherilyn Berry, and I'm the extension agent. I'm an extension agent in family and consumer sciences uh, here in the Durham County Center downtown. Um, I also run the uh, Briggs Avenue Community Garden on South Briggs Avenue. And uh, the way that I'm kind of described around here at the extension office is sort of the resident food nerd. And so normally before in the before times before COVID, uh, I would teach people how to grow food outside at Briggs. And then I would teach people how to cook food here at the food lab. Well, we don't have classes here anymore right now temporarily until this clears up. And so I wanted to be able to make myself available for the culinary side of things. Um, and so I thought it might be fun for each week um, for a while if everybody likes it. I thought I would bring you a weird vegetable just to learn about for a few minutes um, to maybe spur some conversation or some questions. Um, but really I'm here to answer any questions that you have about food, whether it's growing food, cooking food, nutrients, uh, global uses of food, uh, the food system in general, either locally or globally. Um, I'm a big old food nerd. And just like an extension professional, if I don't know, I can always find out for you. So um, let me introduce you to this is called a chayote. So there's lots of names for this. Uh, I wrote it down for you. Chayote, also called meleton or mirleton. Meleton is how they say it in, uh, in Cajun cuisine. Um, also called a choco or a choo-choo or a Christophine, um, but locally they're going to be known as chayote. So if you went to the grocery store looking for this, that's what you would ask for. And in fact, I bet you've walked by this many times and have never recognized it because it's in one of the smaller baskets kind of at the top where like the ginger and the turmeric might be um, or like a or fresh horseradish or something you might find one of these. And basically it's, uh, it's in the gourd family, the, the um, curcubit family. So uh, it grows just like a cucumber. Um, if you cut it in half, it kind of looks like an avocado. It's got this singular seed in the middle here. And what's great about this is the whole thing is edible. So it's sort of like one of the tofu of vegetables, basically. I don't mean to turn anybody off by saying that. Um, but basically, it absorbs the flavor of other things. And so even though it is, uh, it's sort of like a cross between, I've heard it described as a cross between a cucumber and a potato. Um, but it actually, to me, um, is sort of like a cross between a cucumber and a squash. So like a summer squash. So, cause it's a little bit juicier than a summer squash, but you can cook it just like a summer squash. So this is used in all kinds of cuisines around the world because it doesn't take much to grow this. As long as you've got a warm 120 to 150 days, you can grow this. And in tropical areas, it grows as a perennial. For those of you that are not gardeners, perennial means that it comes back year after year after year, like, your, like, like a rosemary plant is a perennial or an apple tree. Um, but uh, in, in places where it freezes, like here in North Carolina, this would be an annual, like a tomato plant. You grow it, it dies, you have to replant it again next year. So that's what, that's what this is. And if you wonder how to cook it, you could slice it up and, uh, and, and serve it in a salad. It's really delicious. It's kind of like a grassy, firm cucumber. Um, you can eat the, um, the seed. Uh, you can also eat the stems and the roots. So the entire plant is edible. Um, in Chinese and Taiwanese cuisine, they'll actually eat the, the fresh shoots. So the, the vine shoots that come out, you can trim those off and fry them up just like, you know, fiddlehead ferns or green beans, something like that. Uh, so this whole thing is edible and they use it sort of worldwide. But actually this plant originated um, with the Aztecs primarily, Mesoamerica is where um, this plant originated. And then with the Colombian exchange of, um, of foods, uh, it ended up being kind of transferred all over the world. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's a chayote. And uh, if you really want to get these cheap, uh, go to an international market, especially ones that serve the Latinx population, a Spanish-speaking population here in North Carolina, and you'll find these and they'll be a couple for a dollar. They're not very expensive. So. Thanks, Sherilyn. We have our first question about the chayote. Ask. Is it high in nutrition? Ooh, great question. Okay, so it is a decent source of vitamin C, 
great source of fiber. Most vegetables have a lot of fiber, which is good because we want to um, treat our gut flora really good. And so we want to we want to get plenty of fiber. It makes us regular, but it also feeds our microbiome so that we have like a healthier overall immune system. Um, so that's a really good one. And then for women who are um, for women of childbearing age, it's important that you get folate every day. Um, if you're planning to get pregnant, or even if you're not planning to get pregnant, that you get folate. Um, we all need folate, which is a B vitamin. It's vitamin B9. Not that that's important. You're not going to be tested on that. Um, but basically, these are important to get every day um, because they uh, prevent neural birth defects, neural tube birth defects. So you want to make sure. That's why a lot of times when women are wanting to get pregnant, they'll take pregnancy vitamins. Well, those just have a higher amount. They're basically a multivitamin that have a higher amount of folate in them. So this is, you get, I think with 100 grams of this, you get like 25% of your folate per day. So um, good one to have. It's good all around and tasty. And the second question related to that is, does it have a lot of carbs? Um, yeah, it is a starchy vegetable. It's not starchy like a potato, um, but it is similar in carbohydrates to carbohydrate to uh, like a summer squash, definitely. So, um, but it has a lot more nutrients than a potato um, comparatively for the calories. But if you were say like on a paleo diet or something like that, you would want to sort of minimize the amount that you're eating. This is a higher protein vegetable, but I would stick to like maybe the shoots of it if you're growing it in your yard or the seed, because this is where most of the protein is. Mm, I have a question about that, but I'll ask the next question from the audience. Um, so what is the easiest and tastiest way to cook the chayote? Oh, wow. There's so many ways. So I like to, um, I like to like grate it up into a slaw is really nice. I also like to serve this on a vegetable crudite. That's like, you know, like a fresh vegetable, uh, uh, platter. Um, you can slice this up and people kind of wonder what it is and serve it with dips. So that's kind of nice. Um, also grilling it is really excellent. Um, but you can really any, anything that you would use for, uh, use a squash, in you could actually um, you could use this in so some people um, actually a, a, a popular dish in Australia where they call it choco um, but it's the same thing chayote um, they actually slice it up and um, make it into like a um, like an au gratin so you you can make this just like potatoes au gratin but slice it thinly and layer it with the cream and the cheese and and breadcrumbs and uh, and that works out also in Australia um, they've used it because in Australia naturally uh, because it's such a warm environment you can't grow a lot of good uh, apples there and so they would substitute these for apples in apple pies so if you only had a couple of apples they were pretty expensive because they were imported you could get these that grow for free in your backyard and slice it up and cut the apples with the chayote or they call it choco there um, and and make a, a pie in fact um, there was a rumor, and I don't know where it started, but it was in like the 80s, that McDonald's made their apple pies out of these because they were so cheap. And McDonald's actually had to put out a statement that no, it's actually 100% apples in our apple pies, but people thought that they used chayote in them as a substitute. Wow, that's cool. I'm, I'm getting hungry. Um, so just <laughs> a follow-up question, every part of the chayote is edible. Yes. All right. So I have a question here that's a little off, off of the chayote, but it's a great question. So I'm gonna read it. Hi, longtime jam and pickle maker who learned mostly from my mom. I've upped my safe canning beyond what I learned at home. Over the last few years, I've had access to Meyer lemons. Mm. So have canned curd in small batches using, using Marissa McClellan's recipe in food in jars. She indicates a shelf life of three to four months and I realized that with eggs and butter, I'm playing with food safety fire. Oh, this is a person after your own heart, Sherilyn. So the question is, is it possible to know by appearance or smell that it's not safe to consume? No. And so what I would do is if you've already made it and you're unsure, I, I'm a really of the opinion, when in doubt, throw it out. Because if it's not acidic enough, it can actually um, it can actually grow botulism, and that's the scariest thing when it comes to canning. Um, that's the thing that that can like wipe out a whole family. So when in doubt, throw it out. That's what I say. But what I would do in the future is the the only book that I recommend or the only site that I recommend to um, 
to can from is the National Center for Home Food Preservation. It's a USDA website and they're updating it all the time, all the time. They're constantly studying and updating it all the time. So what you can do is if you find a recipe that you like in a book somewhere, or if you find one, you know, that your grandma did, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you can take that one and compare it to the National Center for Home Food Preservation. Because, you know, it, if you're making, you know, lemon curd and you wanted to add and it's asked for a teaspoon of vanilla versus a teaspoon, you know, and you decide you want to put a teaspoon of orange extract or something in it, not really, but you know what I mean, if you wanted to do that, that doesn't change the pH that much. But where, you know, changing the pH where if you make the pH higher than 4.7, that's where it can grow botulism. And so, um, you know, the reason that they're saying that, that with lemon curd, it's a three to four months is because it is such a high, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's high fat and high dairy, um, you know, product. And so it's better for you to eat it faster. But the key thing that you have to worry about is how acidic it is. So if you don't have a pH meter at home, which most people don't, um, I would just start over and, um, and compare your recipe to National Center for Home Food Preservation. That also, even though you were talking about botulism, I am still, it made me hungry somehow. Um, that's, <laughs> some lemon curd sounds pretty good right now. Um, so I have another question here, back to the chayote, about um, the seeds. So the seed that you showed us in the picture, um, or the real picture <laughs> in the video, um, is that the seed we would plant to grow a chayote? Great question. Okay, so you can't grow this from seed unless it's a whole one. Okay, so if you know, it, you can actually most of the time if you get a nice fresh one. Oh, by the way, this is only one kind. If you go to some of the um, the Latinx grocery stores, they'll have them that are big and they're covered in spikes and they're called chayote macho. So cool. I wouldn't grow those though because they're thorny. But they also have like white ones and kind of peach ones and yellow ones. If you're somewhere traveling and you see an interesting chayote, go ahead and pick it up. And if it's allowed based on where you're at. Um, like if you go to Hawaii, you can't take anything agricultural. They have dogs to sniff you and your luggage. So you don't take anything out of there. I know because I tried to, I tried to get out with an avocado. I, I was guilty. They caught me. A, a beagle caught me. Um, anyway, uh, so this is really e easy to grow. If you, if you find any, anyone that you want to try and you can even get one from the grocery store and do it, basically stick it in a cabinet in the dark for like a month. And then this little guy, as much as, I don't know if any of you have seen Little Shop of Horrors, but to me, this looks like Audrey, you know, Audrey too, uh, the, at the Little Shop of Horrors, because the seed will start to protrude out of here. It'll open up and it'll look like a little tongue and then a little vine will start to grow. So you can't propagate this just from seed. It has to be the whole fruit. And so I recommend buying one in the winter, like December or January or February, because it takes about a month for it to put out that little vine. And then come, you know, April when, or maybe May, so maybe buy it a little February, March, buy one. And then when you would put your tomatoes in, when it's warm enough to put your tomatoes in, you can put this in. And what you do is you'll have this little vine coming out of it. It'll look, they'll start to shrivel and look kind of ugly, but as long as the vine looks healthy, you're good. And if this is the surface of the soil, you're going to bury it so that this is at an angle and the little vine, so that this, the, the side with the seed is kind of at a 45 degree angle towards the ground. And then this will grow up and make sure that you have a trellis because these can grow like 15 feet. It's like, it's like a cucumber, but um, more buff. And so if you have a family of four, one plant, one healthy sized plant will probably give you 50 merlaton in a, in a season. So it's a lot. So we have a question to follow up on that. So if we have 50, 50 chayote, can we freeze them? Yes. Um, so that's a great question. So when you're freezing stuff, like if you already pre-cooked it, say that you sliced it up and made it into that au gratin we were talking about, you could just freeze the au gratin the way it is and it would be fine. But if you're going to freeze it, like if you say you wanted to do like frozen vegetables, um, what you want to do is chop it up into chunks and then blanch it real quick. So just bring some salted water to a boil salty as seawater is, is preferable. Um, and you just drop it in for one moment, like one minute, drop it in and then take a strainer and strain it out. 
and then shock it in some ice water or cold water, rinse it to cool it off, and then it's ready to freeze. Because if you chop it up, there's this enzymatic reaction that starts to happen. And actually, if you try to freeze it just by chopping it, it's going to cause, um, it's, it's going to break down faster and often you'll get freezer burn. So the best way to freeze any food, but definitely vegetables, is to put it in a zip top bag and try to suck all the air out of the bag like with a straw. Or you can get one of those, um, you know, space saver, you know, those vacuum packers, which are great, but I mean, it's kind of an investment for something like that. If, if you're going to preserve a lot and you have a large freezer, you can invest in one of those really cool vacuum packers. But if you just wanted to freeze five of these to give it a whirl, um, just get yourself a zip top bag and then close it all the way and stick a little um, straw in there and suck the air out of the bag. And if the plastic is against the frozen vegetable, it, the ice won't start to crystallize on the outside. An ice burn food won't hurt you. It just doesn't taste very good. So. That's great, thank you. Um, and so the other one was um, around, um, I think it's, it's again kind of changing the, the topic. So is that all right? <laughs> Ask me anything, that's yeah. what I'm here for. Okay, so the other question um, that we have had come in is about um, tomato plants. And so she says, my tomato plants have um, a brown uh, thing on the stems as they're growing out. And she's asking, is that something I should be worried about um, for the tomato plant? So do the leaves look okay? That's, that's a big question. Um, also, it's really hard for me to diagnose an issue unless I see a picture of it. So um, I can definitely put my email out there. And if you have a question about, you know, you want to send me a picture of it, that would be better. But if it's, looking pretty buff and it's uh, putting off leaves and fruit and the, the leaves look pretty good um, and you don't have a bunch of spots or wilt, you're probably fine. Um, but I, I do watch my tomato plants pretty closely. Uh, a lot of times brand new gardeners really start with like the hardest thing to grow. Tomatoes are the most finicky and they will just die overnight for fun. And it's, it's a fruit bearing plant. And so you work really hard to get that beautiful fruit. And if it dies before then, it's more of a heartbreaker than say, if you were growing lettuce and it died, you wouldn't be as sad because you could eat the lettuce right away as it starts growing. Or if like a kale plant died, you could just pull off, you know, it's not as devastating, but tomatoes are the hardest thing to grow. So give yourself a break. You're not a real gardener unless you've killed some plants. So um, you can always uh, snap a pic and send it to my email. And if I don't know, I have a whole crew of amazing master gardeners that are there to help me with, with any kind, of, um, any kind of, of plant question. And if they don't know, we have the plant disease and insect clinic. So that's what I would recommend is that I could tell by a picture if it's something that you should, you should worry about. Great, so I put your email address into the box now. Thanks, Krista. Um, and I'm not seeing any other questions, but I'm gonna put a call out before we close down. So any anyone else have a question? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, so the next question is back to tomatoes. What's the latest you can plant tomatoes? Um, well, it really takes, I, okay, so it depends. So um we had to plant a little bit later this year uh because it was a really beautiful cool spring i don't know if it's because no one's been driving their cars around that's my guess there's no science behind that but i just keep i just couldn't believe that we were like getting chilly temperatures in june it was odd um so normally you're going to plant in like you know first weekend in may but in 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 mid-may we got like 37 degrees it was odd so usually i plant you know beginning of may for my tomatoes because you get the growth, but then you also get a uh, fruit set on your tomatoes. Now, if you say it's, you know, we have a really hot, brutal summer and it's 90 degrees with 90% humidity for multiple days in a row and you put a new plant in, you might get beautiful leaf growth, but your tomato uh, blossoms will not really set fruit because they are self-pollinating and the flowers, the pollen is sterile over about 90 degrees. So yes, go ahead if you have plant, if you have tomatoes that you have now that you wanna stick in the ground, put them out there and see what happens. And my recommendation, this is how I did it when I lived, I farmed in the deserts of Arizona where it was like, it was by nine o'clock in the morning, it was over 100 degrees with 2% humidity and it would get to like 110, 115. I would go out at six o'clock in the morning with my coffee 
and I tap on all of the blossoms. And that's gonna give you a better chance when the, the um, temperatures are cooler in the morning before it hits 90, you can go out and tap on all of the, um, the flowers to try to get them to set, to try to get them to set fruit. Um, and just make it your kind of little morning ritual with your, you know, a get to know you tomato plant um, kind of time. And, uh, and, and so you could, it just takes a little bit more intervention. And then, you know, as long as there's no frost and it's not too cool at night, then you can continue to grow tomatoes. Um, some people, their tomato plant will die in the middle of the season. They'll just yank that one out and throw another one in. So um, it, isn't, it isn't too late to put in tomatoes. It just, you have to kind of work with whatever weather we're having at the time to set fruit and also prevent, um, you know, to prevent them um, from having frost. So I wouldn't be putting them in in like mid-September. That would be a really bad idea. Great. Um, a follow-up to that one is what plants can you plant now and get a harvest? Oh, oh gosh, all kinds of things. So um, some of the more heat tolerant cucumbers, you can throw those in like Armenians. Those are great. Um, uh, people are starting their collards pretty soon, even though it's, it's pretty hot still. Um, I mean, you can definitely like put in a crop of beans for sure. You could definitely do that. Um, it's still a little hot for radishes and carrots. Um, I don't have my calendar in front of me right now. I'm drawing a blank. Um, and you could, you could start some squash if you wanted to. It is a little late, but a lot of times people will lose their, their um, squash plants to squash vine borer kind of right in the beginning of the season. And you can pull those out and replant them. Um, peppers are fine when it's really hot. I mean, peppers do fine, especially hot peppers. I mean, hot peppers, like, nothing touches those things. But uh, sweet peppers, you could definitely do sweet peppers. Basil for days. Um, any of the perennial herbs you could put in right now. Um, but any of the cooler stuff that gives you like a leaf crop is better for the fall. So um, you could start some of your fall crops inside under a light right now if you wanted, but stuff that you want to put outside, um, I would stick to more of those kind of fruit bearing crops right now. I mean, fruit meaning anything with the seed inside of it. Great, and we're moving back to the kitchen with the next question. Awesome. Any good online resources on safest practices for fermenting versus pickling foods? For example, fermented cucumber pickles. Yeah, okay, so there are, but I encourage you to contact me by email so we can talk about it because it depends on what you're pickling and, um, or fermenting. Um, and it's usually, I mean, if it's cabbage, it's a lot easier. Other things that are juicier can tend to grow mold a little bit more. Um, and so I don't know, I'm gonna look and see. The National Center for Home Food Preservation might have a fermenting section, I can't remember. But um, I would love to have a little bit deeper of a conversation about that and give you some better resources for that. The good thing about fermenting foods is you're gonna know if you messed up. Like there'll be black mold growing on the top of it. Like you're not gonna get botulism from something that's a, that's up has air around it. So it's not an airtight process like canning, like pressure canning. You don't have to worry about the pH so much, but you do have to worry about the salinity. But if you don't get the salinity right, whoo, you'll have all kinds of nasty stuff growing on it and you're not gonna wanna eat it. So I, I would say that fermenting is a lot less dangerous than um, pressure canning, let's say, or canning in general. So um, yeah, fermenting, we should talk about it though, because there's a lot of good resources out there for it. And it just is based on, um, you know, what, what you're wanting to ferment. Great, well, I think we have time for one more question if anyone in the audience wants to give us one. Let's see, not anyone popping up. So I guess they're saving their questions for next week, Sherilyn. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> this, is, this has been fun. I wanna bring you a weird vegetable or fruit every week. Also at Briggs, we have a bunch of beautiful rare chilies from around the world growing. And when those are really kicking off in late August, early September, I would love to do a chili of the week. We have some weird ones, like some really beautiful ones, some really hot ones and some really odd ones. Like one that grows like two feet long in this like weird finger twirly thing. Anyway, um, I'll have the formal name for it by then. Uh, but uh, I would love to share that with you. So just come on back next week. We're just going to do these little informal fun things um, every week just to kind of answer people's questions. And if you have a friend that, you know, just wants to ask some questions about food, tell them about it. And, uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what I find in the, in the uh, international grocery store in the produce department for you next week. 
All right. Thanks, Sherilyn. I'm going to close this down now. Thank you, everybody.